This episode of Nuff Said is brought to you by Tweaked Audio. To get awesome headphones, go to tweakedaudio.com and use the coupon code SOUTHGATE to get 30% off, free shipping, and a lifetime warranty. Or you can get there through the link on our website, southgatemediagroup.com. In our world, there are heroes and there are devils. But in the kitchen of hell, the hero is the Welcome to the Devil You Know. Hello, heroes, and welcome once again to the Devil You Know, the Southgate Media Group and Capes and Lunatics uh, ongoing Daredevil Netflix podcast. Tonight's episode, season three, episode three, No Good Deed. As Fisk moves into swanky new digs amid a public outcry, Matt wrestles with how far he's ready to go to right hit this wrong. Dex's aim comes into focus. Um, the, our director tonight is Jennifer Getzer. Of course, Stan Lee and Bill Everett get those Marvel Comics credits. And then uh, Drew Goddard gets our created by credit. Sonia, Ho- sorry, Sonia Hoffman gets our written by. And our hardest working woman in show business, oh, I'm sorry, uh, two hardest working women in show business tonight. Our story editor is Tonya King, and our uncredited staff writer, oh, working in the shadows, Sarah Streacher. Whoa. Okay, now, um, uh, so this episode, well, it starts with the shower, mm. you know, um, because you got to get yourself clean. Even as you have your little ankle monitoring bracelet on. Really, I mean, after you've been through an ordeal like he just went through, a nice hot shower has got to be pretty comforting. Yeah, and it was an ordeal last <laughs> night, seeing uh, seeing the Albanians try to make their move. Hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, he, he is now where he wants to be. You can see there's still a lot of negativity towards Mr. Fisk, and, you know, you do notice that he is still... Although, interestingly enough, he's not in prison orange, he's in prison blue. <laughs> and I don't know if that is meant to mean something, but you see, he's still in a jumpsuit, just that right. it's no longer orange. Reminds me of an old episode of Match, where Hawkeye got mad about always wearing the color green. <laughs> no, also, I imagine the prison uniform is probably orange. If he's not in the prison, they don't feel like they should be paying for his uniform, so the FBI probably has their own. Uh, mm. Department that handles that, I imagine. You know that that that's an that's an interesting idea. The Department yeah. of Haberdashery. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, the FBI's lead haberdasher. There mm. is a series in that uh, has yet to be uh, unfolded. You know, um, one of the main characters in Black Lightning is a haberdasher. So. <laughs> 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 Is, is this a fancy like way of saying the Mad Hatter, really? Like, uh, well, haberdasher. Yeah, I mean, yes, it's often hats, but uh, oh, is it more than hats? Yeah, actually, it is. It, it actually is. There is more than hats to haberdashery. Um, usually, so it's not like a haberdasher can also dabble in other things, but the haberdashery itself is comprised of multiple things, an equal partner of which is hats. As far as I know, yes. Ha! Huh, um, how interesting. I mean, it may be one of these words that has evolved over time. I mean, obviously, yes, mm. you are correct. A haberdasher often does make hats. But that, see, if you just made hats, you would be a hatter. And I think Interesting. A, I think a haberdashery means mostly, uh, I think it usually means uh, accessories. Hmm, um, fancy guy stuff. Yeah, fancy, fancy accessories is what we'll say haberdashery. Um, Interesting. Well, we're going we're gonna to go with that. We could be completely wrong. <laughs> and if so, right in. Because <laughs> I am wrong often. Uh, I was recently wrong on an episode of Capes and Lunatics where I foolishly said uh, Henry Rollins was, in fact, Trent Reznor. Because I oh, did IMDb. Oh yeah, well, you know what it is. In the new Deadly Class, Henry Rollins is there. And I recognized him, and I knew he was this punk icon. Right. But my brain went to Trent Reznor because I was thinking mm. Nine Inch Nails, mm. which also isn't even Trent Reznor. Well, yeah, actually, it is. Uh, this is actually um, uh, Black Flag's Henry Rollins, right. um, who is awesome. 
but incredibly just, awesome. Yeah, and I know him, and I love him, and he's awesome, and and I recognized his face for his awesomeness, but I didn't have the name to put with it, and I put the wrong name in our review mm. last mm. Uh, last week. Although, Although it's, it's, it's not, like you know, awesome. such a far-fetched uh, error to make there would probably occupy, you know, cells very close to each other in your brain. Exactly. exactly. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. um... So, what happens after the shower? Uh, well, I think that we're taken to Karen's little setup at uh, the at Ellison's house. Oh, yes, yes. The not-so-sly attempt to uh, bring some joy into her life. Well, yeah, or at least sex. Uh, well, well, fair enough, but that, I mean, you know, I guess, yeah, uh, well, you got to make joyful. do with what you can, I guess. You know, I think, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm being cynical there. It's really basically <laughs> about... He know, seems they, like a nice guy. They want to give her cute meat, and, you know... You know, I'm often reminded of uh, there's a character named Connie Ferrari who briefly dated Captain America, and they brought her back recently in the Great Lakes Avengers, and it's like how she really can't settle for normal guys after you've been with Captain America. Mm. And mm. Um, speak human performance, man. So I can, <laughs> I can imagine that, you know, as much as she'd like to be with another guy after Matt, I think mm. maybe... It's hard to be with another guy after Matt, you know? Right, it's, right. He is the daredevil. And, but, you know, she's open to it, and she's fine with it. But, you know, as with all things, her, her, her desire to stand on, to, to get get at Wilson, I think, is kind of undoing things. Hmm. You know? Uh, I think she can't really commit herself to anything other than... Other than the story, really. You know, it's like she's well, right. part of a story I mean, and she wants to be a part she of She loves to, you know, uh, come down on Matt for his need, his compulsion to go out there and do something about injustice. And whereas she doesn't, I don't know if she recognizes, but she's the exact same way. Only she is using the tools life has dealt her. Matt is using the tools life dealt him. But she chastises him for being incapable of stopping the pull of, you know, participating in writing the world. Well, yeah, and I think that is, I mean, I mean, well, that's the thing. We all do what we have to do hmm. in our life, and we all try to build out the world that we'd like to build out. Um, right. Yeah, it's 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 um, it's interesting for Karen. Yeah, she's uh, equally as helpless. Yeah. Well, we're all helpless in the face yeah. of what we need to, what we feel we need to do. You know, we all, and, yes. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. He's, uh, I wonder if they're painting the story this way. It's like he's the only one that actually recognizes, or maybe he's the first one to finally recognize that about himself, and he's trying to save everybody else from having to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, I... Yeah, and I think that is a part of it. I think, I think you know, Matt is in this spot where, you know, I guess where it comes down to is, you know, everyone he's touched has had their life upended. But I think there's maybe a deeper story in here, which was that it wasn't Matt who upended their lives. Their lives were already right. upended when he came into them. That well, it's, yeah. because they live in Hell's Kitchen, <laughs> first of all. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and, and honestly, it, it's very hard for me to, to always get behind the Hell's Kitchen now in, in post-Giuliani, <laughs> New York. It's like, no, you know. No, 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 but I mean in the Marvel Hell's Kitchen, yes. you know, it, it's like Karen and, and Foggy aren't the only ones bad things have happened to. Everybody who lives in Hell's Kitchen has had an equally – you know, high number of bad things happen to them. So it's like yeah. to take that on for himself. I think it's it, it's a bit selfish. Um, and uh, in a lot of this, I, I think he is being selfish in, in in somehow. I don't know, like wanting the glory of it, or or thinking that he deserves to take this on because he's better than you know. I don't know. There there is well, an aspect yeah. to that, don't you think? Yeah, well, I, I think there's definitely an aspect where I think what is kind of deeper with Matt is that I uh -huh. think he feels. He, it's not even so much that he's the, that he wants to, he doesn't want anyone else to suffer the way he is, you know, and that's what it, he sees his life in, in classic Catholic uh, style, 
Right. He sees his life as constant suffering. Yeah, no, but but the thing is, he, like, he enjoys the suffering. He enjoys the martyrdom, and he wants it all for himself in, in, in a little bit, in a, in a kind of a way too, doesn't he? I mean, I mean like, that, don't you think? Don't you yeah. think Karen has the the obligation, or at least the right, to follow her obligation? You know? Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely quality of that as well. I mean, you know, the the thing, I think the thing at play is that, you know. Um, Everyone knows, you know, basically, Matt wants to protect everyone, but not everyone needs protecting. Huh. And that, that, I think, is maybe the hardest thing, yeah. for, especially for a protective personality to understand. Hmm. That, you know, you want to protect all these people, but, you know, it's not your place. Right. And, and if that's the case, then one has to ask the question, why is it so important for me to continuously want to protect these people that don't need it? What is it in me? Where is this impulse in me coming from? And once you ask yourself that question, then, you know, you're, you're treading on interesting waters. Like, Well, you know, I think, I think there's a quality of it that is very much who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, and, and this is the thing, it's like, you know, it's such a hard thing as a parent, uh, hmm. to realize your kids don't really need you always taking care of you, hmm. or they don't need to always be taken care of. Your kids don't need you, you know, making sure everybody's okay and doing this and that and the other. Um, you know, your kids need you to a point, and then they're then they're fine, but it's hard when you realize that oh, it's time to make that transition. Mm. And I think for you know, and for Matt, the problem is is not so much that he is uh, without. It's not so much that he wants to be everyone's dad. It's that because he never because he lost all of his parental figures, never had right. his mom, lost his dad had stick for a while and then he walked off, you know, and, you know, and, and, you know, and even the priest is always keeps keeping him at an arm's length because, you know, it has to have to be professional about this. Right. You don't, you don't want any bad rumors starting after all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I think he feels since he never had, that ongoing good father, he uh, needs to be everyone else's dad. Uh, and he needs to protect them. So he's saying to... <clears throat> so he wants Karen and Foggy to know he's there to protect them. But in truth, he... See, he's only willing yeah. to give them what he wants to give them, which is protection. What if what they need or, or want is different? What if they need just his presence or his attention or his empathy or his uh, yeah. companionship or his company? You know, all those things he isn't willing to give, the things they really want. And the, the shared commisery of, of being in the situation together, of being sort of a, a party, a posse, that sort of thing, you know. But he's mm -hmm. only willing to give his protection. Well, yeah, exactly. And I think that, and you're right there, that that is the inherent selfishness of of a daredevil. So, like, I mean, there's a little something to be said, you know. I mean, I know that it's altruistic and, yeah, and it's to be revered, but there should also be, like, there's a duality to it, you know. Yeah, it was. It's your it's your martyr complex. It's it's a very Catholic yeah. aspect of your your existence. You know, mm, you know mm, when you mm. when you are raised with the idea that the martyrs all get to go to heaven. You know, it's 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 attractive to be the martyr, um, right. and that I think is very much what Matt Matt serves in this. You know, he he wants to be the martyr. You know, and in his own way, he wants to be noble, but at the same time, it's that. You know, it, here's the thing. He feels he has powers, and so he doesn't want anyone else to get themselves involved in something who doesn't have powers. Never really realizing that, really, of all the Netflix heroes, he's like the weakest of all of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like not bulletproof, can't fly, doesn't have a freaking, you know, dragon from Shaolau juicing up his chi. He is, lit he just, he like, he hears things, and... And can see despite being blind. You know, praising this, 
I can actually see. That doesn't make me a superhero. Right, you know? right. Yes, and he, uh, you're right, Tristan, he is very strong. He's trained hard to be a good, and he's basically a super soldier, you know, because all it takes to be a super soldier is proper diet and a lot of exercise. <laughs> um, and also, you know. And a ton of self-loathing. <laughs> well, <laughs> Apparently. You know, or, well, yeah, well, I don't, well, no, I don't think you need the self-loathing to be a super soldier. No, 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 soldier. in this case is all I meant. Yeah, you, you just need to be committed to, you got to be like The Rock, you know? Yeah. It's, like The Rock says, you know, it's really great. It's really easy to lose, you know, uh, all, all this weight and make yourself a perfect physical specimen. What I do is I go to the gym eight hours a day, every day. <laughs> <laughs> really easy. And if you do that, just like that, you know. Uh, uh. Yeah. Yes, yes. You can, or you can go through a dangerous experiment like Captain America. But yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Is, but, you know, uh, proper diet and exercise will make you a super soldier. But, you know, it's a lot of exercise and a very proper diet. Mm. <laughs> and a diet most of us don't want to go into. That's the truth of it. Even, even vegans don't want to be, be that healthy. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, I just re watch these back to back. I'm trying to remember everything that happened. Yeah, I think uh, uh, from here, um, Matt breaks into or sneaks into oh, yes. sneaks what looks into like the Waldorf. Uh, yeah, I think... I think they probably shot it at the Waldorf. It looks that um, way. But I'm, looks, that's a nice hotel. I'm a little surprised that they let him walking, looking as hoboish as he was, trickle of blood down the side of his face and all, you know? Yeah, well, it helps the story. And, you know... They could have dressed him a little bit better. It's kind of a little odd. I know he can't see them, but they could definitely see him, you know? Well, you know, it's an interesting question if he's being quiet. It's entirely possible they can't. You know, there are studies that say that, you know, this is why people like, unless a homeless person gets in your face, people don't see homeless people. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, if you're just, if you're just a homeless person sitting there by the side of the street, many people will walk by you and never even realize they saw you. Right, but I, so I think it, it's also contextually dependent. Like, it, mm -hmm. you know, when I was working at a bar, I noticed when the wrong person came in and had to get him out, you know. It's all these security people, trained security people, and, and you know. Yeah. I mean, I know he's just a person, but he's just look a little too bummy for not to raise anybody's eyebrow, you know. Yeah, well, I guess here's, here's where you can make an argument. He is clean-shaven. Well... Well, he is. I mean, he has a stubble, but he's yeah. not. He's not like. He's not like three. Day, he's not like six day beard man. Yeah. You know? yeah. He's not even like month beard man. <laughs> so, and you know, he is clearly a healthy white male. Yeah, yeah that's so, true. Yeah, that hey, is hey, true. hey, I'll, I'll throw it out there, man. He's a healthy white man. You know? <laughs> Freaking well dressed black guy in the same situation. He's gonna get stopped. Yeah, have I but, seen you here before? Yeah, exactly. You know, but in this situation, I think you know. He's being given, because he's being quiet, because she's not mm. approaching anyone, because he's trying to not be seen. I think that that allows him to not be seen. Right. Um, and, you know, in the, and he does sneak in. He really doesn't get as far as he'd like to, though. No. Um, but he is, you know. Oh, that and the I, other interesting part is we they introduce, so I think for the first time here, um, Matt's conscious take, conscience taking the shape of Kingpin. Was this the first time? I thought they maybe did that last. Did they? Time. I didn't catch it, but I, I just thought it was. Uh, or maybe I, they did, know, and I overlooked it, and I just it just yeah. looked more cool here. But yeah. I, I think it's really interesting the way they're painting that story and the way he lays out his case to him, and how yeah. it kind of almost makes sense. Even even the the nun says to him, she says, you know, be careful that you don't become the monster. And it's like, okay, what if he is doing good? What if he actually is reformed? Isn't it my job to? guide people back to reformation or you know and if yeah. i go and just take him out because i know am i you know it's, it's a very cool way that they're making him question themselves in the face of kingpin himself oh yeah and and without a doubt i mean kingpin definitely has he has he has a case to be made you know um but you know what i'll say is you remember back to the first season of punisher hmm. when the punisher goes in and basically, you know, basically the kingpin tells him, you know, I'll let you walk out of here. Hmm. 
because he is just that powerful. Which shows you, not for nothing, not for nothing, he's not that powerful just sitting on just sitting on money he already made. Hmm. You know, he's not in retirement. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And when he is saying, oh, I'll let you out of all this, because I want you to kill all of my competition. Hmm. Yeah. Mazam, I can't really hear you. Really? Wait, one second. One second. There we go. Maybe that was it. Oh. Okay. I, th- I think I pulled my cord out. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, the, the headphones are great. <clears throat> they have Bluetooth, but my computer doesn't. So. Mm, yeah. Um, but yeah, but the idea is that, you know, when the kingpin, the kingpin is still active in his criminal empire. Because mm. he doesn't, you know, as we know from Luke Cage, what's his name? Uh, the lawyer. Ain't sticking around once the money dries up. Right, of course. So we know that money is still flowing like like champagne at a uh, at a, a sweet sixteen party, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. You know, we, we know that 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 kingpin still got his hands in something. Because yeah. he's he is not sparing an expense, which tells you, even though it seems like he's being good. If you really start to bear it out, there is clearly something. Something's not right. It's like when you ask exactly how does Bruce Wayne make his money, uh, you know, there's something more going on there than just uh, just charity work, you know? Right, <laughs> right, right. Um, but yeah, I mean that's that. Oh, um, but one thing I do want to talk about because I think this is the most important aspect of this episode um, is. Uh, Dex. Point Dexter. Yeah. Dex, Dex, Dex. See, this is Dexter's story. This is one of the things that one of the things I kind of feel about a lot of these Netflix shows is that they're way more about the villains than they are about the heroes. And I'm okay with that. Sometimes. Yes. Here. And oh well, yeah. Yeah. Dex is amazing, but this is what I love is his conversation with the psychiatrist. Mm. And mm. what's amazing about that is that nothing he says is necessarily false. Right. But there are also the right things to say to show you're a well-adjusted person dealing with a very complex situation. Yeah. You know? And, and, you know, and the doctor is trying with all his might to be like, look, I want to get you out of here as fast as I can, too. Just give me something to work with, man. Well, yeah, but I don't think, you know, I don't think the doctor's an incompetent. No, but he is a, a yeah. part of a bureaucracy, you know. Well, yeah, well, exa- well, not for nothing, cops come in after a bad day, or and especially FBI agents, and not for nothing, unlike, you know, some small-town PD where it's just a cop getting trigger-happy, this is a guy who's dealing with active Albanian gangster shooters, ah. you know. It's like, I don't, you know, uh, I don't know if he identifies or not, but let's be honest here. He is, uh, he is definitely within a reasonable person's assumption that this is something a, a person in the situation might have done. Yeah. And, and, and he did it very well. Yeah. So there is this urge to say, okay, most I want to know you're not going to go either put a gun in your own mouth or put it in right. someone else's tonight. Right. And not for nothing, that is 90% of what a psychiatrist in this situation is doing. Mm. Is he's saying, I want to make sure you're not going to put that gun in your mouth. I, I want to make sure you don't eat your gun, right. which is the first rule. Right. And don't make anyone else eat it either. And when he says, hey, look, I got a girl, you know, I tell <laughs> her about my day. And then, and we always go and we get pizza, and then... But no, it's Tuesday. I'll, Tuesdays is pizza night. Yes, and, you know, the minute he says that, I knew, she doesn't know that you're doing this, do you? Oh, <laughs> you caught it right there? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, not for nothing. I know it's bullseye. Right. <laughs> so, I know he's not a very nice person. See, I know? didn't know that uh, off the top. So, at first, yeah. my thought in that scene was... Fisk has got his fingers in everything, right? His reach is uh, unimaginable. So what if the psychiatrist is in his pocket and needling for information from Dex because he mm-hmm. wants to use Dex, 
the index to 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 turn him into one of his soldiers, right? So he needs leverage. Yeah. So I thought maybe the psychiatrist was trying to extract information. I was like, oh, he has a girl. Oh, now he has something on him. And then come to the end, I was like, oh, this is something completely different. Well, you know what? But now that you said that, I think you might be right in that. I think that might be super subtle in it. But it's like, oh, yeah, maybe that is what the Kingpin was doing that whole time. That, that'd be pretty um, cool, huh? Yeah, well, because not for nothing, you know, the girl is someone that he's obsessed with. Mm. And, you know, if if the Kingpin is still keeping his hands on all these prizes, which, I, like I said, I think it's fair to assume he is. Um, he's, he is watching everyone and watching everything yeah. and trying to build his story for it, you know, cause he, he is trying to think ahead of everyone else, I think. Um, oh, for sure. although it's subtle, it's subtle. You gotta watch it here and just think, well, gee, where is he getting all this money? Yeah. And that, that's the real trick of it is like, where does all this money come from? You know? Um, it's not like he has legitimate business interests either. I mean, he might have some real estate holdings. He does own that building that they that he gets to be put up in. Yeah, That's which which old. probably means he owns hotels in tons of other places. Yeah, you know, and he probably has a nice insurance settlement from Midland Circle. Mm-hmm. Let's not forget that. That you know, Midland Circle. I mean, you know, getting your building blown up that can be like one of the best investments you ever. Uh, go into because mm. Mm, you do get that nice double indemnity against terrorism, and um, yeah, you know uh, that is that is what you that that is where you, so you can you can make that presumption, but that they don't lampshade it kind of suggests that they do want you to be questioning mm. how he's getting mm. this money. And um, but yeah, so he he does. Uh, does have um, his little uh, com- his conversation with his girl at the end, and mm. then uh, the final scene. I'm trying to think is is that um, is that Foggy and Matt, or is that next episode? Uh, I think Foggy and Matt. No, happens. It's, it's at the very end here. Yeah. Yeah, because Matt reveals himself to Foggy. Yeah. But again, being the martyr, says, oh, don't tell anyone, you saw me, and all that kind of stuff. Right, so, right. Um, and you need to that, stay away from uh, Fisk, because I got yeah. this. Yeah, which is like, yeah, great. But, you know, as we'll see next episode, it's like, no, you don't get to be in charge of Fisk. You don't right. get to say, I am the superhero, everyone else has to sit back and follow my lead because that's not how this universe works. You know, everyone is affected by Fisk, not just you, Matt, you know? Um, so yeah. And that I think is where we leave it. Although we do see that Matt lifts Foggy's wallet at the end. (laughs) And man, Um, Foggy likes to walk around with a buttload of cash. Well, you know, that is not uncommon for people who grew up kind of always wanting for cash. Hmm. I know for me, there's nothing that makes me feel better than after payday, and I take out like a hundred bucks and I put it in my wallet, you know. Yeah, no, but he looked like he had me. hundreds of dollars. Well, yeah, I think his payday is better than mine. Right. Know? No, it's just a... It's, never I'm still I, struggling. I would always feel weird, like, I gotta put the money away, otherwise I'm gonna get robbed and all of it's gonna be taken. I would never like to have too much cash on me, just in case I got robbed, all I got is this, you know? Yeah, the, the only thing is, is Miles is they can't rob you if you spend it first. <laughs> Fair Guarantee enough. Guarantee but 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 if I could take the money out on Friday by Monday morning, we both got the same in our wallet. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, but you know, I I do get that that's that. I mean, I get that that's his thing. Yeah, I guess. He, yeah, he does have a lot of money, but you know what? He's a guy who feels comfortable dropping the money, and like I said. That's even though it is the Marvel Universe Hell's Kitchen, it's it's still a realistic modern day Hell's Kitchen. Right. You know, I mean, the the gentrification of Hell's Kitchen has occurred. There may be some pockets, and not for nothing, there are still pockets. There are a couple. No, of, the, yeah, there's some pretty, you know, yeah, like well, untouched areas that are still kind of uh, neighborhoody where people all know each other, and and this it's a little. 
Uh, well, the neighborhoody parts aren't the part you worry about. It's the it's the flop house. Really, it's the flop house, not the neighborhood hmm. that is problematic. Right, yeah, but even, are, even they, you know, are sort of like. And I used to work in the area for for a number of years. Uh, I knew a lot of people in the neighborhood, and like everybody got along in a weird way. They all knew. Yeah. I mean, you know, these are bad guys, but there are bad guys. You know, in a sense. Yeah, but but in that situation, yeah, you know, you're not going to be, um, you know, you're not going to be worrying too much about. Um, people mugging you if everyone knows each other, you know? Right. Oh, no, no, don't get me wrong. I was always worried about that, but you know, I guess yeah. it was, you know, beyond that, I guess. <laughs> because yeah. Like, I mean, yeah, accepting I mean, that yeah, as a reality. I mean, <laughs> I yeah, there's a lot of qualities. And, you know, not for nothing, you know, as you know, I'm not a skinny rich guy. I'm a big, I'm a big guy. And so I, I worry less about people mugging right. me. Because <laughs> the couple of times people have tried to mug me, I mostly had to tell them to stop hitting me because it was annoying me. Um, mm. And yeah. I've never given them money, so you know I've, I've been mugged twice, and always I'm like, "Why are you hitting me? That's not nice." And it freaks people out when you like shake off a, a, a slug to the jaw. But mm. I am I am very resilient, or at least have a brain that is not susceptible to uh, <laughs> closed head trauma. Right. Luckily, I, I, I I've never been mugged. I feel like there were two situations where I was about to get mugged. But one of them was uh, coming home on the A train from East New York, and uh, I just ended up making friends with these guys. Like before, they had a chance to, you know, design the narrative that we were going to approach this situation with. I immediately started like making friends with them, telling them stories, and all of a sudden they're laughing, and we spent the ride just hanging out. And I was like, I got out of that one. And then another situation, a guy walked up to me, just having looking like he had bad intentions, and. Um, uh, well, I had, you know, I, and yeah, I don't know if I could tell the story here, but we ended up becoming friends also. So. <laughs> oh, there we go. Sounds good, man. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You don't have to go into too much detail. I mean, right. Like the two times I, I had a situation with. Well, one time I don't know if the guy was actually mugging me. I think he was actually just a schizophrenic guy who like mm. punched me. And I was like, you know, stop that, man. That's not nice. And then he went away. Mm. Um, he was, he was the guy, I think he actually lived in my building. He lived underneath my building, my, my apartment. And he accused me of being a peeping Tom. Oh boy. So, oh yeah. Well, you know, not for nothing. Peeping on him? I have no idea what he thought I was peeping on. Honestly, you know what it is, is there are a lot of, there's a lot of first floor windows in an apartment Mm. building and you park your car in the parking lot and you walk in and there are windows you walk by. And if you're a paranoid schizophrenic, you may think. You're peeping out. Uh, so, but that was him. Mean, he was a big guy, but he punched me. And oh, then, you know, uh, you know, I said, why did you do that? And then the other time I was walking home from the bar to get the Chinese food. And these two guys came up to me and the guy showed me his pistol. Oh, and yeah, well, he didn't. I think it was a, I think it was a toy pistol. I don't even think it was a gun, but he. He hit me with it, you know, did, did a couple of that, and I, and again, I told him, stop that. <laughs> That's really annoying. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I told him, I don't have a wallet, which is true, I didn't have a wallet, because I, I didn't carry wallets at that time. I just had my cards and some cash mm. in my pocket, but, you know, in a weird pocket, so they couldn't find it. So, you know, they said, like, yeah, he doesn't have a wallet, man, I don't know. It's like, okay, go. And then they, like, wandered off, and I was like, oh, that jerk, you know. But, uh, mm. yeah, that was my story. Uh, anyway, this has been the devil you know this week. Uh, Miles, final thoughts on tonight's episode? Um, two I- interesting things. The first one is I'm really uh, I- enjoying the character of Nadine's boss. She is mm-hmm. really good at being a, a boss or a manager of leading people and how she manages his mindset and, and like actually helps him. Um, that, that line she tells him where he's having trouble with what happened and she's like, just focus on the lives we did save. They're just as important as the ones we've lost. I was like, wow. Oh. And you see his face change. You're like, man, she is so good. And, oh, yeah. And that is that. And, and man, thanks for reminding me of that because that is like the best scene. The oh. Whole- the whole, um, this is where she talks about, like, her dad, the trucker. Uh, no, that's, and, again, that's in the next episode. But, oh, that's again, episode. that's oh, such okay. a great, yeah. great, great scene, too. She is yeah, awesome. Cool. So we'll talk about the next episode. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she is a great character, and I love her. And, yeah, she does great. I mean, they're, they're, not for nothing, there are some great characters. It's so well written, this show. That's why I, I think it stands head and shoulders. Maybe not so much about Jessica Jones, but above all the other Marvel shows. This is, like, the, mm-hmm. mwah, you know? Yeah, well, yeah, it is, and, and it is, and it's, man, 
And the second thing that I thought was really cool was in the scene where he's uh, escaping from, I think it was when he was in the Waldorf and he's trying, oh, no, no, that's uh, right after he met with the lawyer. And the lawyer tells him he's just doing it for his woman. After he tries to escape from there, um, he does this really cool thing that I've never seen anybody else in movies do, where he's trying to hide behind the car, under the car, and he does like this almost a one-handed push-up kind of move where his feet are behind one wheel and one hand is behind the other wheel. So even if the guy were to look underneath the car, he wouldn't see him. That, it's just t that's a tiny little detail, but I thought that was so, so cool and something like a real badass would do, you know? Yes, yes, and I, I have to agree 100% with that. It is, it is really, um, I mean, it's just a great show. Mm. So um, that is tonight's episode. Uh, Maz, how can people find you? Uh, they can email me at mazmanzor at gmail.com or find me on Facebook under Maz Manzor. That's M-O-Z-Z-M-A-N-Z-O-O-R. And, of course, you can always write to me in that old-fashioned email way the way our miles and pause ones sit at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word, at gmail.com. And, of course, follow me on the Twitters. I live tweet nothing because we're broadcasting what I'm doing. It. But normally I would be doing the Gotham and I'd be doing the Orville and um, eventually I'll be doing Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and things like that at Charlie Esser. That's C-H-A-R-L-I-E. E-S-S-E-R. Look for the two E's in the middle. Bing! For quality, dear listeners, for joining us in the Kitchen of Hell once more. Remember, there is an angel on your shoulder and a devil. And sometimes it's always just best to stick with the devil you know. Good night.